Take courage, your God goes before you. We've shared over the last few Sundays about five smooth stones. We've been talking about the story of David and Goliath. We've been talking about this story, which I hope has been encouraging you, because ultimately it's simply a story of God's power to deliver his people. How many know that God has the power to deliver his people? How many knows that you go through this book, you can go through story after story after story and understand the fact and the principle, God has the power to deliver his people. And God has been found faithful to deliver his people, amen? So if you look at the story, we understand that this is, that's the, the, the premise behind it. Now, one of the things you and I have to understand is when you and I receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you become a soldier in the army of God. Now, you can try to deny that. You maybe don't want to admit it. But the fact is, if you claim that you think that you are not a warrior, I want you to know that the enemy certainly sees you that way. The enemy sees you that way because you have chosen a side. You have chosen to be on the side of the living God, and he is in direct opposition of the God that you chose to side with. That makes you a warrior. That makes you a soldier in God's army. That makes you someone that the enemy is against, that the enemy is after. And today's verses are going to remind us how important it is that we celebrate spiritual victories in our life. I mean, we're going to look at the end of this story. Do you believe there was a victory? I know there was a victory. There was just not a physical victory. There was a spiritual victory. Uh, And we're going to look at this and say, what do you do after you win the victory? How do you properly respond when you are victorious in the army of God? Well, when this victory happened, when all was said and done, what was the response? Now, we're going to look at the response of not just David. We're going to look at the response of not just the Israelite army. We're going to look at the response of the enemy as well. How many of you believe it's important for us to understand what happens when we have victory, what the enemy's response is? I believe it's important. So if you would, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. As we finish up this chapter today, we're going to just look at uh, five verses, 50 to 54. And uh, let's pray, and then we're going to read in this morning. Heavenly Father, would you bless this word? Would you anoint it? Would you empower it, Father? Would you let it, these words bring more influence than the person speaking them? I pray, Lord, today by your Holy Spirit that you would open up the ears for those who need to hear, the heart of those who need to have it planted, and for the minds of those who need to have it seated. I pray, Lord, that you'd take this word, you'd breathe life into it, and in turn, it would breathe life into us. In doing so, Lord, I pray that we would be transformed because of it. I pray most of all, Lord, it would encourage us, and and Father, that we would not just hear it, but we would, be, we would always be doers of it. To you be the glory through this word. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. First Samuel 17, 50 says, So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and he killed him. So David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and he drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout. And they pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn among the Sherem, the Sherem road to Gath and to Ekron, where the Israelites, when the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and he brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistines' weapon in his own tent. This story can get be a little graphic. Heads being cut off and taking that head with you to Jerusalem, right? We can look at all of that. 
I think it's amazing, you look at the story, that David cut off the, the enemy's head with his own sword, with his enemy's sword. David didn't have a sword. He won the battle with a sling and a stone. But it said he took the sword out of the enemy's sheath and he used the enemy's sword to... How many know that God has already put the heel over the head of the enemy? How many of you know, let me remind you, that God has already defeated your giant? I don't know what giant you're feeding. There was three or four that were on the screen, you know, struggling marriages, a, a, bad, a, a bad diagnosis, you know, some, a job, find, you know, other things that you have going on in your life. But I want to remind you that Jesus has already defeated your giant. Just as David defeated Goliath, Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. As we celebrated that act of his, of his grace this morning in communion, he didn't do it with a stone. Jesus didn't save us with a stone. He saved us with a cross. Jesus won the victory for us, but just as when David killed Goliath, the battle wasn't over. The battle still was not over. Verse 52 says that the men of Israel, the same ones that were afraid to advance toward Goliath, were now shouting and pursuing the Philistines. Reminds me a lot of the disciples in Acts chapter 2. The ones that were hiding in fear. When the power of the Holy Spirit came, they received a boldness and began to move forward, sharing the good things of God. Here we are today with a, with a battle. And at the end of this battle, when the victory has been done, there's a shout. And with that shout, there's a pursuing. There's a moving forward, right? Into where? Into the enemy's camp. A place they didn't want to go be before. Can I tell you that Jesus has already chased the enemy away? Jesus has already chased the enemy away so that he has, now, he has literally no power over us except for the influence we give him. Do you understand that? Satan has no power over you, but he has influenced you. And you give him, you give him the open door when you allow him into your thoughts, into your actions, into your deeds, right? You do that. Jesus has already defeated the enemy. He has no authority over you. Remember the conversation that Jesus had. With Peter, he says, I tell you that you, Peter, are the rock, and I will, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates of hell should not prevail against who? The church. That's us. That's us. We are already on the winning side. The battle has already been, been, been fought, and it's already been, the enemy's already been beaten, and we are victorious. God has provided you and I, as we partook of communion this morning, freedom from the penalty of our sin. And he has then commanded us to advance into the enemy's territory. Wow, we're going to talk more about that as we get toward the end of the message here this morning. But here's the first thing I want you to see about our response to victory, and it's this. Victory sends the enemy running. Yes. Yes. Much of our focus has been on the Israelite army. Most of our focus the last couple Sundays has been talking about David and his position and the fact that he didn't look like a warrior. He didn't look like he was anybody, right? But yet God called him. But what about the opposing force? Well, verse 51 gives us a glimpse into the immediate response of the Philistines after victory, the Bible says they turned and ran. They turned and ran. You see, their champion was now dead. And because their champion was dead, they lost all hope. And can I tell you something? Goliath wasn't coming back to life. It's a time in scriptures that we read when the disciples were down. They said, our king, the guy that we were following, the one we thought was the Messiah, they killed him and they put him in a cross. But he didn't stay there. Three days later, he came back to life. You see, God restores hope. Jesus restored hope. The, high, the disciples' hope was restored. Why? Because God brought Jesus back to life. 
this enemy wasn't coming back to life. The Philistine had lost all their hope. All of their hope was put in one person. All of their hope was put in one man. Can I tell you that that's a mistake? If we put our hope and trust in a person rather than Jesus Christ, we are destined to be let down. Maybe for you, you put a lot of hope into some leader. Maybe for you, you put a lot of hope into some political party. Maybe some of you put a lot of hope into a co-worker or a friend. Maybe it's a family member. Now listen, having trust in people is not a bad thing, but if those people take the place of God in your life, then you will be let down. The Philistines put all their trust in this human champion named Goliath, and without him, they were completely lost. The good news, we have a God who will never leave us. We have a God who will never forsake us. We may experience times wondering, have you ever wondered where God was? I've had those times in my life that says, God, I'm not sure where you're at right now. It seems like we're playing hide-go-seek, hide, and I don't know where you are. It seems like you're distant from me. It seems like you're far away from me. It seems like you're somewhere just outside of my reach, outside of my grasp. It seems like I'm speaking, but maybe you're not hearing. Can I tell you, in moments like that, I want you to know from personal experience, God is always working, God is still working, and God is always looking out for our good, and God always wants to reveal his glory. When you resist the devil, you know what he has to do? He's out of here. What does the enemy do when we have victory? What does the enemy do in this situation? They flew, right? They fled. They had to flee, right? It says, Scripture tells us when we resist the devil, he flees. Victory sends the enemy running. If you've ever had victory in your life, I can tell you, you have set the enemy running. See, because this is the second part of what happens. God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory. It says when the men of Israel and, and Judah surged forward, they, they, they came forward with a shout. And they pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron. When God gives victory, he deserves the glory for it. Too often we as people, because of our own egos, try to take some of the glory for ourselves. It must have been that prayer I prayed. It must have, been the, it must have just been the, the special way I prayed the prayer. It must have been the words I chose. It must have been the fact that I just showed up. It must have been the fact that I did something. I participated right in this victory. God couldn't have done it without me. I was involved in this, so I get part of the, somebody slap me. <laughs> Sometimes we think, well, maybe it's, you know, it was part of what I did that got the job done. Listen, if the devil cannot stop God from giving you victory, he will try to stop you from giving God the glory. He'll try to convince you that it was you or it was somebody else or it was this or it was that instead of giving the full glory to God. The Hebrew word, I love this, the, the Hebrew word for shout because you, you know, this is what happens in verse 52 says they shouted. Now they weren't saying much before. Matter of fact, most of them were hiding back in the back lines cowering in fear. They weren't being very vocal. They weren't speaking up. They weren't saying anything. David runs forward. David kills the giant, right? He cuts off his head. And what happens? The Philistine army says, we're in trouble, and we got to run. So now the enemy is running. All of a sudden, the Israelites are like, chest are puffed up, right? And they start running after the enemy. And it says they do so with a shout, they do it with a shout. You see, the shout is a proclamation. It's a pre-proclamation of victory. When you are worshiping God in the midst of a trial or a storm, when you are shouting out to God, you know what that is? It is a pre-proclamation that God is going to rescue you. It's a pre-proclamation that there's going to be a victory over your giant. They were giving a shout saying, yes, 
The battle is still going on. Was the battle over? The battle wasn't over, but what happened? The enemy started running away. But yet, the, yet they still pursued them with a shout. Because you know what a shout does? A shout distracts the enemy. You know why Satan doesn't want you to worship? Because when you worship, you focus on God. But you see, the shout was to distract. The shout was to distract the enemy. And that Hebrew word for shout is an interesting one because it's a battle term. And it's both spiritual and a physical battle. And we see David in Psalms 108, he's, he's asking the question, he says, who will give us the victory? Who will give us the victory? Then he goes on to kind of answer his own question. He says in verse 12, he says, give us aid against the enemy for human help is worthless. David came to the understanding that we couldn't do this on our own. I can't defeat this enemy on my own. I can't do it on my own. He says, for, he says give us aid against the enemy for human help is worthless worthless but he says with God we will gain the victory and we will trample our enemies and then he really answers he, he brings all of his beliefs at the end when he says with God's help we will do mighty things even Jesus said without me you can do nothing David came to the realization that with God we can do all things without him uh, it's hopeless if we think I think sometimes we are guilty of trying to fight our own battles and our own strength. I've seen too many people do it too many times and too often. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to, I'm going to overcome. I'm going to. You're not going to do much of anything without God's help. <laughs> David understood this when he looked at Psalms 121. He looked up to the mountains. He looked up to the hills. He says, I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And because of his help, and because David understood that, that his strength came from the Lord, it was the Israelite army who decided that they needed to give credit where credit was due. And the victories won by God deserve all the praise to God. There is one more piece of post-victory behavior I think we need to discuss. It's found in verse 53. It says this, when the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. You see, victory requires us to finish the job. God did his job. Now the army had to go on and do their job. When you and I receive a victory, a spiritual victory in the battle of life, and we give God all the praise and the glory because of it, there is something that God is asking you and I to do, and the fact is we have to finish the job. We have to finish this job. And this is where I believe a lot of Christians give up. See, a lot of Christians never go back and get the land. A lot of Christians never go back and get the place. A lot of Christians never go back and get the possessions or the provision that God had for them. Remember years ago we sang the song, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole for me. And we repeated that two or three times. And then we would jump up and down. I'm not doing that today. But we would jump up and down, and what would we shout? He's under my feet. Satan is under my feet. Right? I went to the enemy's camp, and I'm going to take back what he stole from me. And guess where the enemy is? He's under my feet. What were they doing? They went back, and they plundered the enemy's camp. Why? To get back what was theirs. When you are victorious, you get to side on the one who has the victory, who gets all the goods. They went and they plundered their camp. They went to the enemy's camp. Now, in order the, I think it's really important for us to understand, before you decide you're going to go to the enemy's camp, I think it's important for you to know who you are. Because remember what the enemy did at the very beginning of the story? Goliath began to put seeds of doubt into who they were. Who are you to come against me? Who are you that you can defeat me? Who are you to think you even have what you need to have in order to defeat me? 
right? Sowing seeds of doubt, asking the questions. And here we are, it says you need to know, if you're going to go to the enemy's camp, you better know who you are. And you better know who you are in Jesus Christ. So the enemy comes against you, he's going to pull out all the things about you. Oh, I know you. I know your weaknesses, I know your problems, I know your sins, I know your guilt, I know your shame. I know all the strings to pull in your life. I know everything I need to do to get you where I want you to be, to think that you can't do this. We have to know that we know that we know that we go into the enemy's camp. You say, it's not Terry who's walking into the camp, it's Jesus Christ who lives in me that's walking into this camp. And because of the Spirit of God who lives in me, you can't touch this. You have no authority here. Matter of fact, in the name of Jesus, you have to succumb to anything I tell you to do. If I tell you to flee and to bow, you need to do that, enemy. Why? Because the God who lives within me has given me full authority over you. It's the authority to bind the demonic. It's the authority to break strongholds. You're going to go into the enemy's camp. You better know who you are. David understand, understood who he was when he went into the enemy's camp. He said, I'm just a shepherd boy, but I represent the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you are defying the hand of the living God. Not on my watch. David knew who he was. David knew that God was able to give him the victory. And after he defeated Goliath, the Israels chased the Philistines, and then they began to plunder their camp. What does plunder mean? Plunder means really to take by force uh, possessions, especially in a time of war. Remember what John 10.10, 10, remember what Jesus told us about the devil? It says the enemy, the thief, comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. What's, what, what's the first thing he tells us the enemy's going to do to us? He's going to steal from you. He's going to steal from you. Do you know, and I love the song that we sang this morning. It says that there is more power in the hem of Jesus' garment than everything that the enemy has in his camp. I love that. But you know that there are things in the enemy's camp he has stolen from you? The enemy has stolen things from you. That's what it says would happen. The thief comes to steal. What's he want to steal? Well, let's spend a time just looking at that, shall we? First, he wants to steal the truth from you. He doesn't want you to know the truth because there's power in the truth. What did Jesus speak to the enemy during those, th those days in the desert, those 40 days of fasting when the enemy came, right? He just spoke the truth. He just spoke the word of God. He said, let me speak the truth. Satan doesn't want you to know the truth because there's power in the truth. And we all know the truth has a name, and his name is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. He doesn't want you to know the truth. He doesn't want you to know Jesus, but he doesn't want you to know the word of God. Because if you speak it into existence, he has no authority over it. This rules over Satan. When you speak these words, it's the very authority of God, and guess what? He has no recourse. He has nothing he can do. There are times when, a matter of fact, a time even in this church when we had a, a woman who was filled with the demonic spirit and we preached and we prayed and we talked over her. And you know what released her? The moment we laid the word of God over her back, the enemy, the enemy fled. See, there's, he doesn't want you to know the truth. He doesn't want you to know the truth. He doesn't want you to know the power and the authority that the truth holds. And so he will lie to you and he will get you to believe that you think some things are true that really aren't true. There are churches who twist the truth. Getting you to believe what you believe so you feel good about yourself. No, that's not how this works here. I want you to feel good about yourself if it's true. Satan was going to try to steal the truth from you. You better go back and get it. You better go back and get it. Satan's going to try to steal your joy. Has he ever stolen your have he ever stole your joy? You ever wonder what happened to it? 
It's like, man, yesterday things were kind of good, but today I don't have any joy. Well, that's probably in the enemy's camp. You probably need to go get it. How about your peace? Some I know are not peaceful right now. There are things going on in your life, and it's not peaceful. It's not peaceful at home. It's not peaceful by yourself. It's not peaceful where you work. It's just not peaceful in your neighborhood. You're just trying to figure out where is the peace that God said he would give us. I can tell you who has it. The enemy has probably taken it. He loves to steal your love. See, he wants you to love things that aren't of God. He wants you to love the things of the world. He wants your, your attention. He wants your affection to go to stuff rather than God. He wants to steal your love. He wants to take the love that God has given a husband and a wife. He wants to divide that love. What God has put together, let no man put asunder. Listen, he wants to steal your love. He, he, he wants to convince you that God doesn't love you. Oh, you made a mistake. God doesn't love you. God doesn't care for you. Oh, things aren't going really well right now. It's because God turned his back on you. Oh, you're struggling right now? Well, see, God doesn't even seem to care. He would have showed up right on his white horse and saved you, right? And he deceives you in trying to convince you that God doesn't love you. God doesn't care for you. What's he trying to do? He's trying to steal the truth from you and to convince you that God's love isn't real. He's going to try to steal the gifts God has given you. You've all been given gifts. You've all been given a gift. When God created you, he had a plan for you, and that plan, he gave you the gifts that you were going to need to fulfill that plan. But Satan wants to tell you, you can't. Oh, you can't do that. David, you can't beat Goliath. There's no way. His dad told him, his brother told him, his king told him. It's a good thing David didn't listen to them. Instead, he listened to the voice of God, which is the truth. But too many of you have been listening to Satan tell you, you can't do the very thing God created you to do. And I'm here to tell you that you can. That was all of my excuses to go into the ministry, excuse after excuse. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Basically, it's I don't want to, is really what I was saying. And then when I pulled out the trump card and says, God, here it is. The excuse of all excuses, God, I am not worthy to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm like, there you go. There you go, God. That's my exit out. And as soon as I said the words instantaneously, God said to me, good. Because the moment you think you're worthy, I can't use you anymore. And I tell you, God has given you gifts. Don't let the enemy steal them from you. And I don't care how old you are. I say, well, my, I'm too old now to do what God's called. No, you're not. Moses was 80. Right. Moses was 80 years old when he found out what God had called him to do. Listen, you're not too old to listen to the voice of God, to listen to what he has said, to tap into the giftings that he has given you. Some of you have turned your back on the calling of God. Some of you, somewhere maybe in your life, you've been called into the ministry. You've been called to be an evangelist. Maybe you're called into the mission field, and you listen to the enemy, and you decided, no, maybe I just can't do that. Devil wants to steal your health. Devil wants to steal your destiny. Devil wants to steal and destroy your finances. Devil wants to steal your time. I'll just make you so busy you don't have really time. I, as a matter of fact, I can make you so busy for the kingdom you don't have time to spend time with God. You don't have time to experience the victories. You don't have time to just sit into the presence of the Almighty because I'm keeping you too busy. He loves to steal your time. And sometimes God just says, sit down and be quiet and be still Amen. so you and I can hang out and talk. But the enemy will steal your time. I don't know anybody today that I talk to that says, I'm really busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. How about you? Are you busy? I'm bu Everybody's busy. The enemy wants to take your job. He wants to take your self-worth. Oh, he loves taking your self-worth. 
He loves humiliating you. He loves pouring doubts upon you. He loves giving you guilt. He loves giving you shame. He loves condemning you. And that's the purpose of what he wants to do. Those are just a few of the things that I think Satan wants to steal from you. The list could go on and on and on, I believe. Whatever you can think of that the enemy has stolen from you, can I tell you something? It's valuable. You may not think it's valuable, but I have news for you. If somebody's going to steal something, it's because it's valuable. If I left a broken, run-down piece of junk sit in my front yard, I wouldn't worry about anybody coming and stealing it. Because there's no value. But if I put something of value out there, then maybe I should be concerned somebody's going to come along and take that. What the enemy has stolen from you apparently is very valuable because he's taken the time to take it from you. You see, he thinks God's love is pretty important, so he's going to take it from you. He thinks your health is pretty important, so he wants to take it from you. He thinks the truth is pretty important, so he wants to take it from you. He thinks your gifts and your calling are pretty important, so he wants to steal it from you. He thinks your finances and your job right and your self-worth are all pretty important. So what's he want to do? He wants to steal them from you. You have to understand that these things are valuable because the enemy wouldn't want them if they weren't. And remember, this is a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle that you and I are in. And we have to go back. This story tells us we have to go into the enemy's camp and we have to plunder and take back what he has stolen from us. You see, the, fact, the, the victory isn't over until we finish the job. If I have victory and don't go back and get what was stolen, I'm still missing something. God is waiting for us to plunder the enemy's camp. Matter of fact, he wants us to go back and take what the enemy has stolen from us. If the, enemy that God, if the enemy knows that God has a plan for your life, then you can be sure that he's going to be busy trying to steal it from you. God has given us the victory so that by faith we can possess it. Do you understand that through the grace of God, you and I are overcomers. We are victorious. We are on the winning side. I want you just to reflect for a moment about the things that maybe the enemy has been stealing from your life. Listen, if you are in bondage from the enemy, you need freedom. If you don't know who Jesus Christ is, then you need salvation. If you have not plundered the enemy camp, then you need to go back and get what he's stolen from you. Because that's what God wants us to do. Is just know who you are before you go in there. I want to pray for you as we close this morning. First, I want to pray for those, maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've been trying to live life on your own. Maybe you've been trying to take all the credit for your victories. Maybe you've been trying to figure out that you, maybe you think the devil has convinced you that you're going to get to heaven just based upon all the good things you've done. Maybe the enemy has lied to you enough to say, well, you're going to get there. You, heaven, God isn't going to send anybody to hell. Truth of the matter is, nobody gets to heaven except through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man gets to the Father except through me. Jesus is our gateway. Jesus is our ticket to heaven. Jesus paid the price so our sins could be forgiven. There is nothing you and I can do to earn our salvation. The only thing we have to do is open our hearts to receive the work that Jesus did on the cross for us. See, the enemy has been lying to you, trying to deceive you, to keep you from enjoying the benefits of being saved under the blood of Jesus Christ. This morning, I would encourage you to turn to Jesus. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Would you say it with me? Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and I want to turn from those sins and now invite you to come into my heart and come into my life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and my Savior. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.
I'm going to ask you to stand with me, church, before we pray this last prayer. Now, Pastor Bruce and I did not talk. And when he chose this first song that we sang this morning, he had no idea what I was preaching on, but the Holy Spirit did. And when he texts me back and he says, I think I want to do the first song again at the end of the sermon, I was shouting hallelujah. And I said, yep, because that's right where God wants us to be. But here's how I want to close the service this morning. If the enemy has stolen something from you, we need to go to the enemy's camp this morning. And we need to take back what he has stolen from us. Maybe for some of you, maybe it is your self-worth. Maybe for some of you, it's been your health. Maybe for some of you, it's been your giftings and your calling. Maybe for some of you, it's been your finances. Maybe for others, it's your relationships your marriage I want to encourage you this morning we're going to pray a prayer of restoration I'm going to ask that you would come to the altar this morning if there is something the enemy has stolen from you and you said you know what I'm coming to get it back I want you to come to the altar this morning as we pray I'm going to ask Pastor Bruce to maybe just sing the first part of this song and then we're going to come back and pray this prayer of restoration. There's power in the presence, power in the blood, yes. power in, in the, the name of Jesus. Jesus. There's, There's power in the presence, power in the blood, power in the name of Jesus. And he has more in the hand of his garments than in the camp of the enemy. There's power in the presence, power in the I didn't come here to hide in the crowd. I'm passing through to you. I don't care how. Reaching out my hand to get the healing. I've got a faith beyond the bleeding. Because I didn't come here to hide in the crowd. There's power in the presence, power in the blood, power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the presence, power in the blood, power in the name of Jesus. He has more in the hem of his garment than the camp of the enemy. There's power in the presence, power in the blood, power in the name of Jesus. That this morning there's power in the blood of Jesus. I pray that you didn't come to hide in the crowd, but you came to take back what the enemy has stolen from you. Amen. I want to pray this prayer over you. Would you in faith raise your hands to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Would you open your hearts? And would you believe with me as we pray this prayer? Satan, we are taking authority over you in Jesus' name. You have taken things that never belong to you. Things that God has gifted us as his children. His promises, which are yea and amen. And we've let you hold on to things that belong to us for way too long. So, Lord, we come today knowing that you are a God of restoration. We come to you today, Lord, knowing that you are a God of healing. We know that the enemy comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. But you have come to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. We declare the enemy has no power over us. We stand here this morning with a firm faith in you, Lord. 
We declare that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loves me. I claim victory in this situation and I trust your provision and your protection. Enemy, we put you on alert because we pray that God will restore everything you have stolen from us sevenfold. And I believe you are a God who can do more than we could ask or more than we can imagine. Lord, I ask you to restore joy. I ask you to restore peace. I ask you to restore hope. I ask you to regain health and finances and relationships and opportunities in the name of Jesus. We are reclaiming what is ours today, Lord, because we are victorious because of the blood of Jesus. I trust, Lord, that you will bring good out of every situation. And I pray, Lord, that you will use what the enemy meant for harm, for our good and for your glory. I pray, Lord, today that you will strengthen our faith and you will help us understand that you are always and forever our protector and our provider. I thank you for your faithfulness and for your love that endures forever and ever and ever. Amen. And now we claim what is rightfully ours. We return and we restore and we take hold of that which the enemy has taken. <coughs> and we put him, <coughs> excuse me, we put him under our feet because that's where he belongs. Would you raise your foot and stop it down and say, Satan, that's where you belong. Jesus restored to me everything this enemy has taken from me. And I give you a shout. Shout today with victory. Shout today to the King of Kings. Shout today that what he has stolen is now yours. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We are well, I went to the enemy's camp. And I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. Well, I went to the enemy's camp. And I took back what he stole from me. He's under my feet. 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 Satan is under my feet. I went, went to, to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. Well, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. He's under my feet. 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 Satan is under my feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.